the story of humankind, of life on planet Earth, is the story of a continuous cycle of death and rebirth, both at the macro and the micro level. Nowhere was there a more profound shift from the period in the Middle Ages commonly referred to as the Dark Ages, at a point in time where the planet was laid to waste by famine, epidemic, and great despair. But as we've seen countless times through history, the light always emerges from the darkness. And in the period that we now refer to as the Renaissance, the rebirth, the great Renaissance men of that era, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, brought a level of creativity and innovation that was unprecedented in human history. And it has had a profound effect on the way that we live our lives today. But creativity, without the funds to support it, just as today, does not happen. So patronage was largely the result of a singular, very powerful family, the Medicis, who actually had the power to determine which pope would sit on the throne at St. Peter's in Rome. And two Medicis in particular, Lorenzo Medici himself, an artist, a painter, a musician, was the funding behind both Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, and of course we're familiar with some of the great works that resulted with the patronage of Lorenzo. Another Medici, Marie Medici, was an important patron for the great artist Rubens in the legendary Marie Medici cycle that graces the, the walls of many of the great art museums across Europe. And we have seen countless examples over the years of death and rebirth. But one that I think is very interesting as well is the Dark Ages that were the post-Watergate, post-Vietnam era, 1970s and early 80s, a time of great malaise due to stagflation, high unemployment, an energy crisis where we would sit in lines to wait for gasoline for hours on end to get a ration, okay? There are some phenomenal parallels between the creative class, the artist, and the technology entrepreneur, the scientist. We both walk along parallel paths. We are looking to create things of beauty. The great late Steve Jobs is every bit the Renaissance man that Michelangelo or da Vinci was. So in the Florence, Italy of our times, in Silicon Valley, a new Renaissance was born, a Renaissance that invented the personal computer. And for those of you who are not familiar with this photograph, it is from the, ninth, the, the notoriously famous Apple 1984 television commercial that was broadcast once and only once on the 1984 Super Bowl. And it's the most talked about and blogged about and dissected ad in its time. And it was very prophetic, certainly a prophetic around the Arab Spring that we've just witnessed. And the power of the, the, the masses to rise up. But just as it was in the days of the Medicis, it's a cliche to say that if you can dream it, you can do it. Because without capital, no, you can't do it. And here in Montreal, we know that there's been a significant brain drain to Silicon Valley. There are 30,000 Canadians in Silicon Valley today. Many of them are there because the capital they needed to manifest their idea in the market did not happen. And so, you had to also genuflect to the current day Medicis in the 80s. Those Medicis were people like the Rockefeller Foundation uh, fund called Venrock. These were men of privilege, and if you were fortunate enough to ingratiate yourself with these men of privilege, you could in fact fund your venture and you could do something powerful in this world. Okay? But then something happened not that long ago. We faced our Megadon the almost complete meltdown of our financial system. And our current day Medicis blinked. 
they hesitated, and the wheels of innovation came grinding to a halt. And thank goodness for the resilience of the human spirit. Because what we saw happen, and Facebook is a very important part of what's happened, and we all know their IPO is happening uh, just in another week or so. The demand for Facebook's private equity created a secondary market that has been dreamed about for as long as I've been a high-tech entrepreneur for the last 25 years. But the secondary markets allowed liquidity to flow back into the hands of countless thousands of entrepreneurs who have become angel investors themselves and are now funding the next wave of great innovation that is not just sweeping North America, it is sweeping the globe. And it is being pooled in mentor capital organizations in a very intelligent way with a tremendous amount of value add to bring companies from the four corners of the earth to the fore. Okay. Great example in New Brunswick, just, just across the strait is, is a, a number of companies are benefiting from the same phenomena. Jerry Pond, a legendary angel investor in that community, has funded a number of companies, most recently Radian 6, purchased for half a billion dollars by Salesforce.com. Q1 Labs purchased by IBM for well over a billion dollars. And we've created a whole new community of angel investors in New Brunswick and a whole new wave of innovation is happening. But what I'm most interested in is not technology as an end, but as a means. And Steve Jobs and the iPhone generation and what Facebook and social media have done is they have captivated the masses and they've allowed a whole new wave of entrepreneurs to see that they can use technology as an enabler to address social causes and to fund the arts. And this is a phenomena that is universal in scope. Every race, creed, color, nationality, every corner of the earth is now engaged. And the citizen entrepreneur is no longer a cliche. What I love is as I work with as a professor and as a mentor in many of these mentor capital programs, the extraordinary idealism of today's millennial generation. It reminds me of what we saw in the 1960s. It really hasn't been that way for the last 50 years. And so one of the young women I've had the privilege to get to know, Jessica Matthews, graduated from Harvard a couple of years ago, and she did not go to Wall Street. She did not go to work for McKinsey. She's a Nigerian woman, and she decided that she was going to try to make a difference in her home country. And she came up with this ingeniously simple idea that all kids like to play soccer. So they created a soccer ball so that when you play soccer, it stores electricity. So no longer do you have to heat or light your home with a highly carcinogenic kerosene lamp, which is the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. You play for three hours with a soccer ball and you can light your home for three hours. Now, Jessica is now tapping into a completely newly democratized source of funding, crowdsourced funding crowdfunding from sources like CrowdRise and start some good, where all of us are now patrons, investors, and activists. Many of you know the XPRIZE Foundation. It was really a pivotal moment in world history because we used large financial incentives to, to drive radical breakthroughs for the common good of mankind. And of course, you're familiar with the private spacecraft. And you're probably familiar as well with the $10 million prize that went to a company that can get to 100 mile per gallon with an automobile. But that success has been so remarkable that it has driven success or has driven now new competitions across education, energy, space exploration, and the life sciences. It's popularized these kind of competitions in general. So at the Holt International School of Business where I teach, we have the Holt Global Case Challenge where every year the Holt Business School donates a million dollars to the Clinton Global Initiative. And we have a crowd-sourced competition, very much like an NCAA bracket, where in each of the five cities where Holt has a campus, they are given the charge, university students from around the world are invited to participate to solve intractable problems. Last year it was around water, this year it was around extreme poverty. Dartmouth recently ran a competition to fund the design of a $300 house that can be built anywhere in the world so that anyone can live in a house and have dignity. IBM, even corporations are now involved. IBM running their global smart cam competitions and trying to draw technology into the common good. Sproxel, a company that is addressing drug counterfeiting in the emerging economies of Africa, for example. 
And today's Medici's are not patrons, they're investors. Jackie Novogratz from the Acumen Fund and Linda Rotenberg from Endeavor were early pioneers in saying we're looking for people who bring business acumen and an entrepreneurial intent to the way that they address social problems. Linda was in a cab in Argentina and in her discussion with the cab driver, she found out that the cab driver had a PhD in engineering but was driving a cab and that spurred her to action. And what she has done over the last 10 years is truly extraordinary. Okay? Pierre Omidar, the founder of eBay, the quiet force in philanthropy, bringing technology and philanthropy to a point of convergence and driving it through microfinance and other mechanisms. The famous Peter Thale, one of the founders of PayPal in the 20 under 20 where he's paying people not to go to university, but he's giving them a million dollars to start a project that will solve some social issue. And now finally music. Music is the language of the soul. And if you go to South by Southwest or any of the other great music festivals, you'll see thousands of bands looking to get heard above the din in the post-apolitic Napster world that they live in, where record companies no longer fund them and they have to fend for themselves. And of course, artists have to connect with their audiences. And there's a level of affinity that each of us has with the music that we love, and Springsteen speaks this so well. And at that South by Southwest, as Springsteen gave the, he gave the keynote this past year, he said, you know, there's 75 different types of music here, categories. Doesn't matter what kind of instrument you play, what kind of music you play, all that matters is you bring your passion to your performance, as Springsteen has been doing in a legendary way for the last 40 years with his four, five, six hour concerts. A local entrepreneur here, Roger Lepage. Many of you are probably very proud of Mr. Lepage. He recently won the McDermott Award for integrating technology into art, like the Wagner cycle, okay, with his company here in Quebec called Ex Machina. And so there's a tendency to bring technology and art together even more closely than what Mr. Jobs has done. Okay? What I was struck by at South by Southwest is many of the tools that I've used in the startups I've worked in for the last 10 years to connect with my customers are now being used by music musicians to connect with their own audience, okay? And we can take great inspiration from a rare Renaissance era artist, Albert Doring, who in fact did not go the way of many people, did not try to ingratiate himself with the Medici's or those other sponsors. He used technology to create replicas of his art and he sold them at scale. So he was a great inspiration for our current artists because today artists have to think of themselves as entrepreneurs. There's a great program being co-sponsored by the Juilliard School in Carnegie Hall in, in conjunction with the New York University Stern School of Business where they're bringing fellows from these two programs together with MBAs and providing marketing and other types of business support to allow these artists to be more self-sufficient, okay? Many of you probably have seen the remarkable video series on YouTube, Playing for Small Change. The person that produced them and turned that into a record in a, mu in a world music tour, I saw him recently in New York and he said, the best music that I hear all day is what I hear in the subway on the way to the studio. How many people agree with that statement? So we want to give voice to these important artists because art is what makes us human. Art is what brings light into the world. And all of these new crowdfunding types of approaches, Kickstarter, this year alone will provide $150 million in funding to thousands of different artists across many, many different types of projects. And that's more than the entire budget of the United States National Endowment for the Arts. So if you could dream it, you could do it, was not true until today. But we are all now citizen, investor, advocate, activists. And it's important for us to be able to give rise to new voices, different voices. And I'd like to now introduce on stage one of those voices, a friend and a colleague and a U.S. National Slam poet champion, Marshall Soulful Jones.
Introducing the new Apple Eye Person Complete with Multi-Touch. Doesn't it feel good to touch? Doesn't it feel good to touch? Compatible with your iPod and your iPad. Doesn't it feel good to touch? Doesn't it feel good to touch? No friends, there's an app for that. No life, there's an app for that. You're a complete loser. There's an app for that. Doesn't it feel good to touch? Doesn't it feel good to touch? Doesn't it feel good to touch my world? My world has become so digital, I have forgotten what that feels like. It was difficult to connect when friends formed cliques. Now it's even more difficult to connect now that cliques form friends. But who am I to judge? I face Facebook more than books face me, hoping to book face to faces. I update my status, 420 spaces to prove I'm still breathing failure. To do this daily means my whole web wide world will forget that I exist. But with 3,000 friends online and only five I can count in real life, why wouldn't I spend more time in a world where there are more people that like me? Wouldn't you? Here. It doesn't matter if I'm an amateur person, as long as I have a profile, my smile is 50% genuine, 50% genuine HD. You would need Blu-ray to read what is really me, but I'm not that focused. 10 tabs open, hoping my problems are resolved with a 1500 by 1600 resolution, proving we might have missed a step in this evolution. Doubled over, we used to sit in treetops, so we swung down to stand upright, then someone slipped a disc, and now we're doubled over at desktops. From the Garden of Eden, to the branches of Macintosh, apple picking has always come at a great cost. iPod, iMac, iPhone, iChat, I can do all of these things without making eye contact. We used to sprint to pick and store blackberries. Now we run to the sprint store and pick blackberries. It's scary. I can't hear the sound of Mother Nature speaking over all this tweeting. And our ability to feel along with it is fleeting. You would think headphone jacks inject in the flesh the way we connect to disconnect power on until we are powerless. We might be love drugged like e-pills. So we e-trade, email, emotion like e-commerce because now money can buy I love for $9.95 a month. Click to proceed to check out. Click to X out where our hearts once were. Click, I've uploaded this hug. I hope she gets it. Click, I'm making love to my wife. I hope she's logged in. Click, I'm holding my daughter over a Skype conference call while she's crying in the crib in the next room. Click, so when my phone goes off of my hip, I touch and I touch and I touch and I touch and I touch because in a world where laughter is never heard and voices are only read, we are so desperate to feel that we hope our techno logic can reverse the universe until the screen touches us back. And maybe one day it will when our technology is advanced enough to make us human again.